Good morning and welcome to New Beginning Celebration. We are excited about what God is doing in our lives and what God is doing in the land. He is showing, showing himself mighty and strong, even in the face of opposition. And we are, are just overwhelmed with the glory of the Lord in our lives. Thank you for joining us by way of YouTube, Facebook, whichever media outlet you've chosen to view us on. Uh, thank you for sharing us with your friends. Thank you for liking us. Uh, we do appreciate your time and your presence with us. I pray that it is not wasted, but it is fulfilling by the Spirit of God, teaching what he does and what he has written, the Word of God. Um, I am only a vessel being used of him, and he is the one who does the work. So please, if you find a nugget somewhere in this Word, don't give me credit. Just glorify God that he is opening up our eyes and sharing with us the true riches of who he is and all the amazing things he does for us. Um, thank you all. Welcome you all who are here in, in, in person. Uh, I do appreciate your time this morning as well. Let's give God a great big hand one more time because he is amazing. He is amazing. So thank you for joining in with me to just give the, the Lord a hand clap of praise. We are finishing up today, and I do say finishing up. I can say that at the beginning because I... <laughs> I believe it's going to be finished today, a series or a message that was titled or is titled, Adam, Where Art Thou? It turned out to be a three-part series, and that's okay, because you, you want to know something? We'll take our time to learn everything else in life. It's just, we have to be so careful about learning how to put that head on that vehicle. We have to be so careful to learn how to put the bicycle together for our children. But we want to rush through the word of God like it's just something to do just to get through it and pass it on to the side. And I'm just a firm believer that the more time I take to learn and to dig and to, to meditate and to chew on the word of God, I find it massaging my soul. Renewing my mind and my life is victorious. And I, I'm here to tell you, my life is victorious. Whichever way you want to shape it or look at it, but if you knew my story, <laughs> if you knew my story, if you knew the story of some others that I know and live, and I watch their lives, and this is what they do. They take time to do just as Joshua said. Joshua said, be careful not to let the book of this law depart from your mouth. That means speak it all the time. And meditate in it day and night. That means to, when it's that word meditate, it's like a Hebrew word uh, that means like a cow chewing the cud. You sit there and watch a cow in the field, and he stands there all day long and he just chews and chews and chews. And he meditates on that thing. And they said, be careful to do all. They said, meditate on it, how long? Day and night, and be careful to do all that is written therein. Then you shall make your way prosperous and you shall have good success. I'm telling you, that is the formula for living through the kingdom. One of the formulas anyway. The other one is confessing with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believing in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and you will be saved. And every step you make in the kingdom of God has to be followed through with that principle. Or you're not living in the kingdom of God. You just walked in the door. Yeah, you're in there, but you're just standing there. You still have to confess, have to believe in your heart and have to confess with your mouth those things which you believe in your heart so that you can continue to take the next step. Now you've gotten away from the front door and you're walking through the living room. Continue to do that. Now you're going to go into the kitchen and, and the dining area. Continue to confess and believe and you're going to walk down the halls and go into each of the bedrooms and the offices, the garage and walk around the yard. See, it's, it's a continual walk. Ah, I'm excited. So today we're continuing with Adam, where art thou? Part three. Adam, where art thou? We re we're reminded that that is a question that God asked Adam when he fell in the garden. After the first sin, God asked Adam, where art thou? Where are you, Adam? You've moved. Something has happened. You're not in your rightful place. Something has changed. There's a division between you and I now. And Adam knew. Adam knew. And Adam, Adam and Eve tried to recover life and restore their life unto God by their own means, by trying their own thing, their own method, and covering their bodies with fig leaves. 
That was the first religion. That was the first religion. Man trying to devise his way back to God. That was the first religion on earth. When they put those fig leaves on, instead of them turning and repenting and allowing God to come in, the creator who created everything anyway, to go ahead on and do something to restore them, they decided to formulate their own religion and it was done with the fig leaves. Then God showed them, no, this is what I require. Fast forward to the, to the age of grace. Guess what happened? God showed us what he required. Islam's not going to do it for you because that's religion. Huh? Confucianism is <laughs> not going to do it for you because that's religion. And all those other things. What was what, 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 team of terms? What's that? What's that? Oh. Buddhist, Buddhism is not going to do it for you because that's religion. That's not God coming to you, showing you how to come to him. That's man trying to take himself to God. And that's exactly what Adam and Eve started. So for all those religions and cults out here, it all started with the fig leaf. But God said, no, we are going to have to cover you with animal skins and innocent blood. Blood that did not do this. Blood that is sinless, that had nothing to do with your transgression, is going to have to be shed to take care of your sin and your transgression. Hence, fast forward here, we have Jesus Christ. Innocent blood, sinless blood had nothing to do with our transgression and our sin, had to be put on that cross and shed for the sins of many. Hey, I'm excited. Let's, let's move into this thing. Everybody turn with me to Proverbs 127. 127. We've dealt with Adam being a man. Adam standing up. So if you missed it, I'm not going to recap that much today. If you missed it, there's part one and part two on the YouTube channel. Please go back and check it out so you can keep up with Psalm 127, I'm um, excuse me, Proverb, uh, yeah, Psalm 127. What did I say? Yeah. Glad to see we got some good, we got good students in this church. They know when I was wrong. <laughs> Psalm 127. They checked me on everything. And you know what? I am happy to know that I can be checked. Anybody who's a little too grown for your britches, for somebody to correct you just because you have a title, uh, supervisor, manager, pastor, boss man, um, you might want to reconsider. You're still part of the community. I'm a shepherd amongst the flock of God, not over the flock of God. Psalm 127. When you have it, please say barbecue chicken. All right, that's what I'm talking about. Y'all, this sermon is going to be quick now that I got hungry. <laughs> here we go. Psalm 127. We want to concentrate here from verses 3 to 5. And let us read. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but speak with their enemies in the gate. Father, thank you for shining your face upon us. You are awesome and always amazing. You are wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Hallowed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You are good and your mercy endures forever. And no one, there is no one like you, Lord. For you are the Lord and you are God and besides you there is no other. This day, Father, we ask that you will intervene in our lives. That you will infect us with the word of power. That our minds will be renewed and our lives will be changed and all things that are good will be restored unto us. That we can walk in the fullness of the blessings that you have given to us. For you declared in your word that you've given us every spiritual blessing in heavenly places already. It has been given to us. So help us to sit at the feet of Jesus today and to learn of you. To hear your word that is life changing and then not only changing our lives but will affect the lives of all of those around us. Help me to decrease so that you will increase. Help each one of us to decrease so that you will increase. And then we ask God as we open up to you, boldly coming before the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. 
that you will fill us with the knowledge of your will and all wisdom and all spiritual understanding, that we may walk fully pleasing unto the Lord and worthy of your calling, and that we will be children reflecting who you are in and about and throughout the earth so that all will see and we can declare the word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and people can ask, what must I do to be saved? Help us to be a living example in our communities and in this vast darkness that, that has overcome this world or that is trying to overcome this world, Father, that we can be um, revealers of who you are then others will know the name of Jesus. We love you, Father. We thank you. May I do this word no harm today, but fill the lives of the hearers with that which you have purposed for them to know. Amen. Proverbs here, or Psalms, excuse me, I keep wanting to say Proverbs. Psalms gives us this word that says, children are a heritage from the Lord. Psalm 127 and 3. We've already gone through Adam as a man, woman, who she is in reflection or in regards to Adam and Adam's responsibility towards not only himself and towards God, but towards his wife and the wife's responsibility to help Adam be that towards her. Because you're going to reap the benefit when you submit to that husband and he can pour out as God leads. Well, children, is it's the same thing, but it's going to be a little bit of a different stance for us, Adams. Children are a heritage from the Lord. And the glory of children is their fathers. That's Proverbs 17 and 6. Proverbs 17 and 6, that the glory of the children is their fathers. Okay. How many of us have had, if daddy wasn't always present in our life, have had that male figure? That was just that superstar in our life. Whether it's father, grandfather, an uncle, a coach, a teacher. There's been some male who has had to have some impression on us. And I hope that when that one person was, we didn't fight it. This is not a perfect setup in the world anymore. When transgression happened in the garden... We didn't always have the perfect setup of the family dynamic. It was ruined. Y'all know my motto. Y'all know what I say, and it is true. Every family since Adam and Eve was dysfunctional. Totally. Totally. From the children that are born, there's no little innocent babies. I know we like to say that, but all was, all, for all of sin, it comes short of the glory of God. As David said, in sin I was conceived and I was shaped in iniquity. So, you know, they, they may be precious and, and without, you know, training. But innocent, no. First thing I had to do was teach my child how to do the right thing, not do the wrong thing. It was automatic to grab that hot stove. It was automatic to try to put the key into the light socket, which did happen one time and never wanted to plug in a radio the rest of his life. <laughs> yeah. At two, two or three years old, that solved that problem. Mm -hmm. Never put those little plastic things in the wall. And someone would just possess them one night at, after two or three years of life. I think I'll try to start the car, I guess. But we as fathers have a great responsibility. We like to always try to, society tries to cast it off. Mom should do all of these things. Mom should, but well, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't pray to my heavenly mother. I pray to my heavenly father. And if the family dynamic is supposed to be the reflection of the relationship of the church with Christ or God with God and with his son, then we have to really put back in position the importance of fathers. We've listened to the great noise around the world of mama being the one ultimately responsible for everything with this. Well, she's the nurturer, and we're both equally as responsible for fathers. Our role is huge, Adam. Our role is huge. It was Adam who was told first what's going to happen on the earth that got what God desired as far as being fruitful and multiplying and filling and subdue the earth. It was Adam in who the loins, in his loins, the children already resided many moons before the children ever got to be mama's children. We're not diminishing the mother because without mother, the children don't get here. 
But daddy, you carried that seed as soon as the sperm started to incubate into the body. As soon as it started to be made. I was my daddy's child. 10, 11, 12 years before I ever knew who mama was. Me and my brothers and sisters knew each other long before mama ever even knew she had four children coming her way. Because we were with daddy the whole time. We're the, we the seed. He's the seed giver. So me and Jojo and Raquel and Adam, we were in there somewhere all together. <laughs> I know, right? I know somebody's getting ready. Oh, gosh, don't pick that picture for me. God is good. And he has a plan for each one of us. And we got here not by accident, but on purpose. But listen. The Bible says that children are a heritage from the Lord and the glory of the children is their father. Because of these two passages, we are able to invest carefully into our children that they may inherit all that we can give them. Look at this. I'm going to examine this here. Psalm 127. We are a heritage from the Lord. That means that's something that is given to us. We didn't have to go out and buy children. We didn't have to go out and find children automatically planted into our loins was our children. We didn't walk out and pick and choose which one and pick our favorites and our non-favorites. That means, so, so that, that wipes away the fact that we should be choosing favorites, that because if some child has some, something that is not so naturally appealing or has something going on in their lives that we don't deem to be perfect or just right, that we can banish him off. Because if you believe in the word of the Lord, that child who may have a deformed hand or some abnormality of some sort physically, that's your child. And you fight for that child just like you fight for the one that can, that can leap from the free throw line and dunk a ball and, and the, the other one at 30 years old, you have to push in a wheelchair. Never was able to walk. Maybe not even be able to hear. That is a heritage from the Lord. And see, that wouldn't have been so if sin had not come into the world. So, Adam, we have to take responsibility for that child because Adam sinned. Adam made a choice in the garden, and we are all Adams after him. Made a choice in the garden that brought some of the things that occurred with our children into play. We have to keep our focus on the Lord and understand how important these children are with us. The fruit of the womb is a reward. So moms, here you go. What a reward. Daddy gets to plant a seed that becomes a reward for you. We still got this interplay between Adam and Eve or mother and father, husband and wife. Interplay here to bring forth that which God calls a heritage unto man. The fruit of the womb is a reward. What a blessing. I remember when my son was born, born uh, my biological son was born, I just couldn't contain my excitement. And when the, 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 the doctor or the nurse, I, don't, I can't even remember which one now, put that little boy in my hand, I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, I have never shook that violently over just a human being, a part of my life. It's my son. You're going to be special. And with mama laying down there still in the bed anticipating to hold her son, her child too, I took when I lifted him to the Lord. And I began to declare God's power over his life. So you will get him in a minute, but we got first things first. This child is a gift back to you, Lord to honor you and to bring glory to your name forever and ever. And I ask that you will invade his life right now and infect him with your love and with your power that he will be used of you to do mighty and great things in the name of Jesus Christ and then hand him to his mother. I'll never forget that. The Bible then goes on to let us know in verse 4 here in Psalm 127. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are, the, so are the children of one's youth. 
So there it is. The declaration that I made over that son was to begin to point him in the right direction. Arrows in the hand of a warrior are precious. You know, you'll run out sooner or later. So when you have a target with an arrow, this is what the Bible is trying to picture. It has to be intentional. It has to be purposed. It has to be directed and guided to hit its intended target. You got one shot with it. One shot with pointing your child in the right direction. Not saying you can't go along the rest of life and start to try to clean up the mess. I've had to work to clean up messes because I didn't always point my arrow in the right direction. And it veered off of target. God is right there. Why did I point my child that direction or that direction or that direction? The bullseye is right there. And that's where we go with it. So that warrior knows every shot counts. Because if I don't, I can get, I can be ruined. I can be ruined. My name can be ruined. My life can be ruined. When I don't put my children in the right direction, not only will they falter and fall, then I, I'm, I'm occupied with trying to clean up messes when they're 25, 35, 40 years old because of my misguidance. Because of me, instead of shooting at the bullseye, pulled my arrow over to the right or the left and instructed them in things and let them do things. And, you know, sometimes they'd be, well, you know, you, you don't want to over control them. Let me tell you something. The Bible has something. We're going to read that verse later. Train up a child in the way that he should go. In fact, that's my next verse. Let's go right on into it. We are to invest carefully in our children so that they may inherit all that we can give them. The Bible declares in Proverbs 22 and 6 that we are to train up our children in the way that they should go. And when they are old, they will not depart from it. Let not the world try to instruct us in how to direct and order our children, how to train our children. Let me help you understand. It is a training. How many of you have been in a position of training or in a 90 day period of training? Or in training sessions, whether it's one day, 10 days, 90 days, 120 days, and somebody wasn't walking side by side with you diligently. Every moment, everything, no, well, we have to do it this way. Well, let's direct it this way. And give an instruction constantly on how to take care of the task at hand. That's what we're supposed to do to our children. And that word train is also a word that is, is even used from the Hebrew in regards to the breaking in of a horse. Uh-oh, like I told you, children ain't innocent. The devil has already got his hands on them all the way back from the garden. Thank God that God has his hand on them. He's still the creator. But it means that even the breaking in of a horse. Anybody ever seen a horse try to be? He's going to buck. He's going to resist. He's going to kick. He's going to try to throw you off. And you want to know the sad part is? So parents let it happen. We were in a store one day. <laughs> and my son, I'm going to send out shouts out to him, Darian. We're standing in the store in the line waiting to check out. And some little kid right there, you know, the candy and all the stuff. And the little comic books and cat cartoons and whatever. All the little the little knickknacks they want the kid to get, to get in their hands. So their mom and daddy say, oh, yeah, I'll buy it. <clears throat> Didn't get what he wanted. <clears throat> Some little kid. Just, just, And when mama said no, he hit the floor and squawked and kicked and rolled. My son looked at me. He said, ooh, Popeyes, look. <laughs> and I said, yeah. He said, you going to go spank him? I said, boy, if his mama look at me and give me the nod, he has got a whoop behind the day. That needs to stop. Where was Adam? Where was Adam? So when that mother walked out in public with that child, see, my son understood. Made a phone call as I was judging the Drum Corps International World Championships in Orlando, Florida, 1996. Never forget it. Made a phone call. I've been down there all week. Hey, how's everything going? And oh, everything's fine. I was like, oh, really? Okay, good. 
Darian, stop such and such. We talk a couple minutes. Darian, what? Darian, I said stop. Darian, I said, wait, hold time out. That was three times. That's, that's a strikeout in my book. Put him on the phone. Darian? Yes, Papa. What did your mother say? She said the rest of that week, <laughs> he was like a resting kitten the whole week. Just from the sound of Adam's voice and diligent training, you do not raise a child. Whoever says, well, we, we need to raise our children. We don't raise children. We raise hogs. We raise pigs and cows and animals on the farm. We just throw the food out there and they just, they just go about where they want. They're raised. We raise plants out in the garden. But children we train. They need side-by-side -side guidance and discipline. Y'all going to make me do it. Y'all going to make me do it because you're here and you're listening. Let's listen to what the Bible has to say about this training. Hold your horses right there. Speaking of horses. Hold your horses. The Bible says over here in Hebrews chapter 12, let's check it out. Hebrews chapter 12. I'm going to write this down on my paperwork. I love that the Lord can, can cause me to remember things right in the middle of a sermon. See, it's not about me. Hebrews chapter 12, we're going to start at verse 5. And we're going to go to verse 11. Chapter 5 through verse 11. And we're going to read. And you have, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. The Bible, and then it quotes from Proverbs 11. It says, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Listen to that. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens. And scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? Chastise. Discipline. But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. If you're reading out of King James Version, that's where we get the word bastard. If you are without chastisement, you are a bastard and not a son. I never, unless until except when I was teaching, but I still never instituted the kind of discipline to someone else's child, lest it be my, unless except to be my nieces and nephews, like I did my own child. Your nieces and nephews are like your own children. But I never went to the neighbor's child and went on ahead and applied the, 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 the board of education to the seat of knowledge. But they, my son got it quite frequently the first few years of his life. And let me tell you something. Well, hardly anything I had to do after that. Just speak. Uh, Darian? Yes, sir. <laughs> it's amazing how that works. A good friend of mine at work, when they asked when our two children were walking off by themselves to go to the little carousel ride outside of Kmart one day, and they were getting away from us a little bit. I said, Darian, now she and I had talked a lot about how our parents distant blend us, when, you know, at, at breaks on the job and stuff. We would talk about that and the kind of training and upbringing we had and, boy, how good it was. And look, you know, we didn't, you know, it didn't bother us. It didn't hurt us. It didn't kill us. It was good stuff for us. And so I said, Darian, he turned right around and came right back and stood by my side. See, some people be like, well, that's being a, no, 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 no. That's being a trainer. Did my son have time to play and have a good time? Absolutely. He didn't have to come stand right beside me, but he understood. He did not ask for permission to even walk that far away from me. I mean, they're getting 40, 50, and 60 feet on. And the other little girl is standing there looking back going, like, why, why did you turn around and leave? And so her mother looked at me and says, how did you do that? I would love to. I said, you know all those conversations we had? Are you following through with the way our parents trained us up? 
Well, uh, I said, that's the problem. I said, see, that's the problem. You know what got you to where you are today, and you have fallen away from that good thing, even though it seems painful and grievous, it hurts and pains you to have to, don't think I have fun when I have to discipline my child. It's not fun at all. But I know if I'm going to save his life, if I know I'm going to have to go and pick up a phone from the other side of a glass one day and have a conversation with him, then guess what? Not everybody and anybody is going to get the opportunity to invade my son's life or to create any other kind of trouble. He's not going to hear the voice of the devil over the voice of Satan. All right, here we go. And I'm telling you, we, we, did I miss it? Man, I missed it a lot. I missed it a lot. And so for anybody else that's missed it a lot, pray, confess to the Lord, be cleansed. And allow God to still give you time, even as your children are adults, that you will get to be a part of their life and make up for that which didn't happen. Because, see, the Bible says you'll train them up in the way they should go. When they're old, they will not depart from it. So there might be some time that they squirmish to the left or the right away from good training. And hopefully they will follow the good instead of the bad. But we can only pray and then intervene. So let's keep going. So it says... if. If you endure chastening, or if you're good, all is well. And if you don't, you're just as if you're illegitimate and don't have any parents. Listen to verse 9. Furthermore, we have had human fathers. Did you hear that? It didn't say human mothers. Daddies, Adam, where art thou? We have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? Wow. Not saying mothers aren't supposed to discipline the children, but Adams, we have to take it up first. It's just something about the sound of the voice of that man. Then the Bible goes on in verse 10 and says, For indeed for a few days, they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them. And our humanness, we, the best we believe to take care of our children is what we will do. But God, he, for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. He know perfectly well what's going to bring us to him. Perfect. He is the perfect all-knowing God. He knows perfectly well what it's going to take to get us to be fully committed to him. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present. God Almighty. Boy, I remember them days and nights. I remember just waiting, hoping mom forgot or dad forgot. And I slip on in the bed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then I hear the bedroom door open. Uh, did you forget something? I uh, know. I, I, I came to bed. You know, what, what's, what's, what did I forget? Uh, you need to come see me. <laughs> And that's bad when they're going to ask you to come see them so you can get your spanking. Oh, my gosh. For they indeed for a few days chasing us that seemed best to them, but for our prophets, but he for our prophets that we may be partakers of his holiness. Verse 11 says, now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, listen to this. Listen to this, Adam. We'll be blessed when we do this. Nevertheless, Afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Now, we've gone from train your children up in the way they should go all the way over here in Proverbs 22 and 6 to Hebrews into the New Testament. Trained. Trained. It is a diligent work. It is a never-ending work. It is relentless. The devil is vying for the soul of your children. If he asked for Peter, he asked Jesus if, if, if to, 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 he could sift Peter as we. He says, Satan has asked to sift. Well, if, if Jesus is telling Peter this, who, who did Satan talk to about it? Satan has asked. He knows he can't just do anything he wants to to you because you belong to me. But he has asked if he could sift you as we. As we. 
There's nothing new under the sun. When did Satan do that one other time in the Bible? Again, yeah, yeah, exactly. With Job. He's asking for you today because you belong to Jesus Christ. You are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. He sees that seal. He cannot open up that seal because he is not the Lamb of God. The revelation tells us that the seals can only be opened by the Lamb of God. So he's got to ask for permission to antagonize your life. Don't you or I yield to him and just automatically give it up. Let's leave the power in God's hands to say, sure, I permit you to mess with that part of his life. And I can guarantee you, that's my sheep. He knows my name and my voice. He will not curse me to my face and die. Let's go back to Psalm 127 and take a look at that last verse. It says, happy. 127 and 5 says, happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. A quiver. What's a quiver? Some people don't know what a quiver is. A quiver is like the little basket pouch that holds the arrows on the back of the warrior. And it's good to have your quiver full of them. You want as many arrows as you can have. Now, I'm not suggesting you go out here and have 17, 18, 19 children. But whatever is the capacity of which God determines you to have, have them. And enjoy them. And in your quiver, every time you turn around, you got something that's going to carry forth the name of the family with grace and honor, integrity and dignity, glorifying God along the way. Blessed is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. That man shall not be ashamed. If he points those arrows in the right, see, we got to go all the way back to the, to the third verse and points those arrows in the right direction, and he will speak with his enemies at the gate. Adam, where art thou? What we do in our responsibility towards our wives, Adam, and towards our children, can make us honorable, prominent men of our community. Because as we've, as we've already discussed, those were the only men who were known at the gates. And see, this thing gives us a little bit more from Proverbs 31, where it talks about and her husband was known at the gates because that wife, that woman walked through town and she lived in town in such a way that it was like, wow, she must have a dynamic husband. Who is that man? Let's go get him to sit over here at the gates. Now we get more explanation to it just to prove or substantiate or, or help support that which I was able to give out that I've studied that it's that, that the men at the gates were there to speak to the people passing through, some that wanted to come in to, to rest or to lodge for the night or to buy goods or trade. And it says that they were able to speak even with their enemies at the gate. Because there were some people you didn't let come in. Uh, I'm sorry, you're not. It wasn't the New Bern Police Department going to talk to them. It wasn't the Craven County Sheriff. It wasn't the governor the president, it wasn't even the mayor of the city. It was those men whose reputation was built upon the reflection of how they dealt with their homes. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. You know, even to be qualified to do what I do as a pastor, Part of my qualification is based on what I do in my home. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, pastor, shepherd, overseer, in case anyone wants to argue the, the terminology there, it means all of them, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. That means people can't walk around and just point at me and say, well, I saw him and I heard him and I saw him and I heard him. Just a bad reputation in town. He must be the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, that means a drunkard, not saying you can't drink wine, not violent, not greedy, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetousness. One who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. Any of those things fall out of place too far, baby, I'm disqualified. 
My qualification doesn't come from a theological seminary. My qualification did not come from going to Bible school. I've taken enough courses and classes. I think I've counted over 147 different certificates, diplomas, and, and, and degrees sitting in my drawer. I've taken enough Bible classes, courses, and seminary classes, and university to, to serve me well. That's not what qualified me. What qualified me was my love for Jesus Christ and him calling me to do what I do. Giving me the gift to teach so that I'm apt to teach. And all of these little things have to be somewhat of a checklist. Are you qualified? Does my wife and my children behave in the community in such a way that they want to say, go find that man who belongs to that woman, who belongs to those children, so he can sit at the gates. Have I missed it on some of that list? Probably every bit of it, every now and then. I'm still missing some of it every now and then. Here's the difference, you're not staying there. David had some, 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 a terrible crime, a terrible injustice, a terrible, a terrible sin. But the one thing that God loved was David repented when he found out and was revealed into his heart. It was him and what he had done. See, that's called, we call that in, in life resiliency or recovery. God is so good and faithful. All he wants us to do is to live a repentant life. Failure can be daily for some. It can be hour by hour for some. But we got to be trained up just as we train up our children, God says, I'm going to train you up as well in the way that you should go. We need to be nurtured in the training and nurturing of the, and, and the admonition of the Lord. And the Bible declares that, that we as children of God will get that from him. Here are some other foundational guidelines. And I, I'm sorry, I, I just read that that I read also from 1 Timothy chapter 3, if you were taking notes. Starting at verse 1. I can't remember what verse it ended at, 7, 8, or 9. 1 Timothy chapter 3. For the qualifications of a minister. And how we deal with our homes. Adam, where art thou? Where are we men? Where are we husbands and fathers? The Father's Day message that's taken three sections, huh? It's pretty amazing. You want to know why it's okay to take a little bit more time to kind of readjust the male because we're God's head on earth. We're God's man. And let me tell you, I, I, I visited this weekend two women of my family who the man is not there anymore by way of departing from the earth. One home, stop that, belonged to my mother. And I'm in there Working, doing things that my daddy probably would have done in this situation. And because he's not there, the things I was doing is because he wasn't there. Praise God, he's in the presence of the Lord. I stopped off and saw one of my aunts in Greensboro and spent quite a few hours with her yesterday. And the Lord let me know when I called her that there's something you're going to need to do for her. See, Adam, where art thou? Me being a young man, 55 years old, just a little, you know, I'm just a, a pup. As they always like to call me a pup. When you're 70-something years old, oh, you still, you're young. They won't think of that when they were 55. <laughs> let me tell you, this body, and in just a few short days, I'll be 56. This body is feeling it. Maybe I pop, crack, snap, crackle, pop. I feel like a box of cereal when I get up. Pour a little milk on me, you're going to hear some work. I moan and groan at every move sometimes. I walk slowly when I get through riding in the vehicle for an hour and have to step out to go to the restroom at a restaurant or something. And I just start moving slowly. I have to warm up. And I was, and the Lord let me know, yeah, there's something you needed. So I get there, and she mentioned something that had gone wrong with one of her toilets in the house. And one of her sons, who's, you know, about... 10 years younger than me, he had come by the home and repaired that one briefly. And it's been a couple of weeks, but she said within a week, the other toilet started doing the same thing. I said, well, you know, that's kind of normal. They were both built and put in at the same time. You can expect one's going to break down. This one's probably going within the next few weeks to six months. And uh, 
She mentioned it a couple of times, and it was bubbling in my heart. The Lord reminded me, I already told you you had something you need to do for her. And I looked and I said, Aunt Mary, show me what's going on. Which bathroom is it? Show me what's going on. We walked in, looked at the toilet. And she showed me the, the example of what's going on and some things not working. And I said, okay, I got it. Let, let me check it out for a little while. You know I walk in the spirit of my daddy because my daddy can fix anything. My mother didn't know what it was like to call a repairman for any, I mean stove, refrigerator, air condition, breakers going bad in the, in the electrical box. She didn't know what it was like to call a repairman for anything, especially if it had to do with a car, truck, or bus. It was over. And somehow or another, he just said, Psh, all right, Damon, you're going to get all this too. Man, sometimes it is not good. Because I, <clears throat> I sit there and I examine. I leave out of the bathroom. I said, listen, <laughs> told her what was wrong. <clears throat> she immediately wanted to give me a card, go and buy the item. I went to the home improvement store, bought the item, came back, and repaired the toilet. <clears throat> and was she was just so pleased. And she said the Lord had been speaking to her while she was talking to us. Tell him what's wrong with your toilet and ask him if he can fix it. You see how God sets things up? There's a time when he'll speak to us about something. We may not know it's him speaking to us right then. It's just a fleeting thought that pops in our head, but it's just not a fleeting thought. Sometimes God has spoke to a person, I, I want you to go attend that church. Just give it a shot. It might be what you're looking for. They're small in number. But I got a word coming in that place. He might tell you to go talk to a certain person about something like uh, the example she gave us yesterday of going shopping and they didn't have a $5 in her pocket. Walked in there and somebody who she knew from a few years ago, a few years past, <laughs> she loaded her basket up. She said, well, all I got is a credit card. She said, no, I how many people go buy groceries on a credit card? I really wanted to stick my hand up and say, you know, I've done that quite often in my life. But I chilled. I didn't want my aunt to look at me like I was crazy. I'll, I will do that one next time. I wanted to just be happy, happy, happy that her toilet was fixed. And that lady turned around and told me, do you remember me? And she had a hard time remembering her. She said, oh, yeah, I want you to do it. And turned around, she looked at the kid cashier after she rung her stuff. She said, oh, I'll take care of that. And a basket full of groceries went to her house. Because the Lord simply said, just go to the grocery store and start loading up your basket. <sighs> Sometimes simple obedience will bless you as well as somebody else. It's amazing. Let's keep going. So with that, Adam, where art thou? We have to learn to listen. We have to learn to listen. Because Adam, we are needed in this world. We are so, so much so. We, if we disappear... Ladies, we're not saying y'all can't function. That's not, the, that's not the, the point of this message. But there is a strength, a power, and a knowledge. My aunt sat there because, you know, she's old school. She's 81. She's old school. She said things about, you know, since my, my uncle has passed, you know, the painting and this and the that. She named this list of things. She said, child, I ain't got no business doing that. That's a man's thing. She wasn't being condescending, saying that's work beneath her. She was like, I don't have the power I don't have the wherewithal or the knowledge to carry forth that. I don't have the ingenuity or the intuition. The things that is gifted for me to carry that forth is not for me to carry. That's a special gift God has given a man. Adam, where art thou? Mm -hmm. And when my father was alive, when her husband was sick, my dad would drive two hours from Raleigh or an hour and a half all the way from Raleigh to Greensboro to take care of her business probably about once a month, doing cutting trees down, doing the lawn, painting, fixing things at the house because he just loved his sisters and took care of his sisters. Adam, where art thou? Sometimes now, not only do we have to take care of Jerusalem, our immediate spot, but then the Bible says, and Judea and Samaria and throughout all the earth. Sometimes, Adams, we got to start at home. We got to take care of home. That's what Jesus was talking about when we're going to preach the gospel. Start at home, but then you're going to have to start to expand out just a little bit. There are ladies that need my help. There are ladies that need your help. And sometimes we just have to be that Adam. Say, okay, why? Because we're to be men known as with integrity 
in the community so that we can sit at the gate. Listen to this about our children here. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Bring them up in the what? Training. There's that word again. Not that you're micromanaging. That's a different thing. But training, meaning keeping an eye on, observing, correcting, redirecting, and directing, guiding, advising, admonishing, sometimes disciplining, chastising. All of that is a part of that nugget. Ephesians 6 and 4 is where that comes from. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Teach them the word of God as you yourselves live Christ-like lives before them. Let that example be lived before them so that they can see what they're hearing your mouth say. Yeah, I, I, you know, I know that, that phrase of do as I say and not as I do, but you should be doing I should be doing. I should not have to ever look at my child or anyone around me that I'm teaching. I, I mean, I can't stand up here and teach the word of God and say, do as I say and not as I do. I teach you the word of God. Then I get out here and you see me cussing the man out walking down the street. Dang. Okay, well, that's what happened. And now, listen, I have no shame about letting you know. <laughs> If there was a such thing as a cussing championship, <laughs> back in the day, I'd have more gold medals and trophies hanging on my wall than you can shake a stick at. I'd have been in the final four against Red Fox, Della Reese, Eddie Murphy, and Richard Pryor. They'd have had a fight on their hands. Because I knew I was a bad, I would see somebody trying to cuss somebody out sometimes. They just couldn't, it just didn't even flow right. I'd be like, man, hold up, hold up. I, know, I don't even know you, but let me tell you how this is supposed to go. Listen, this is what he's trying to tell you. <laughs> and cuss break up syllables of words and put a little cuss word right in between you got to know how to do that thing <laughs> oh I'm sorry this ain't cussing training I apologize y'all trying to man, we thought we were going to hear the word this man trying to train us how to cuss No, I'm, I was terrible it's funny but I can give you a good cussing and pick my nose and walk on the way and not care anything about it that's how you do that brother Come to my training school. Listen, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 9. Deuteronomy is the fifth book of the Bible, Old Testament, book 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This church knows that, right? Mm -hmm. Y'all know Genesis, Exodus, right? Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Just my pages are sticking in my chapter 6. ain't cooperating. There we go. Okay. Deuteronomy chapter 6. We're still talking about Adam, where art thou? Dealing with the entire family structure now. We've gotten down into the children. Adam, what is our responsibility as Adams? Some of you out there have got to be careful. You're trying to be Eve's. The way the world is trying to push you to be Eve's, I'm here to tell you, you need to stay put and listen to this message because you are an Adam. There are things biologically your body possesses that tells the world you are an Adam. If you come up looking like an Adam and tell me you are Eve, I ain't going to get raunchy with you, but I'm going to tell you, let me see your ID. Don't tell me, uh-uh, uh-uh, we ain't into that LGBTQ, elemental P, and they adding letters to it, too. I saw, I saw an LGBTQIA or something this past week. What? That might be the problem. Somebody's daddy won't teach them how to be Adam. Somebody's daddy wasn't teaching that young man to be trained, wasn't training him up in the way that he should go so that when he is old, he will not depart from it. Parents, I know there's some of you that, that this is going on with, with your children, and it's heartbreaking. But the heartbreak is only a gauge, like a needle, like a gauge in a car that indicates something is wrong and you have to do something about it. Don't sit there and just let it keep going. You can't kill them. You can't take it out of them. But what you can do is fall on your knees and pray to the Lord God Almighty 
And every time you see that child begin to nurture them with love and with the word of God, don't give them that word that, ah, you're going to die and go to hell because you're living it. But Jesus Christ loves you, and he gave his life for you. God created them male and female. I changed your diaper. I know that you're a male, or I know that you're a female. Let's talk about this. What are you feeling? What are you hearing? How did we get to this place where you're directed that way when I know you should be going the other? Talk to me. I want to know. I want to know your deepest feelings. I want to know these things that are hurting you or that are paining you or these things that are making you feel good and feel like you're correct and right in what you do. Because I'm not going to be able to correct what you do. I want to correct who you love because of who was in love with you. And I'm telling you, it'll change things. We get more testimonies from people who were former uh, gay, lesbian, homosexual. More testimony. We watching video of the young lady who had come out of homosexuality, and she she started laying it down. But listening to her invokes a way of being a minister towards those who are dealing with this demon from the same devil that wants to kill all of us. Because see, we all had our vice. Yeah. Let he who is without sin cast the first stone. So we will testify in truth, and the truth will make us free. That we can all declare what our vice was. And there's somebody that is coming across your path you have to share it with. Because somebody needs deliverance. There are even some Christians still dealing with these strongholds and hang-ups and things in their lives. You know, I see people that see a Christian fall in sin and they want to say, well, you know, I, I thought they were saved. They obviously in sin. Whoa, 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 whoa. That's, that, that's not your call. Unless they're working with you in ministry, that's not for you to try to evaluate. What you to do is to believe that that person is a brother or sister in the Lord. And the Bible says when you see them fall, go help and lift them up. So that the same things don't overcome and overtake you. Well, Paul talked about it and it's all in the Old Testament. Ah, okay. We're gonna learn how to how to not only learn the word of God, but we're gonna and not live by, by the word of God, but we're gonna learn how to love like God loves. And these words, verse six, we're going verse six through nine in Deuteronomy chapter six. I think I talked enough. Everybody can find it here, just just because I'm I, I have lots of things to say. Can you believe that? <laughs> and these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. What are we going to teach them? These words. The biggest place where failure has happened and occurred in Christian homes and homes that are non-Christian is the word of God was not being taught. It was being talked about. Or we drug everybody to church and sat them in front of a preacher. Where was what was my responsibility at home? He's talking to the home. Wait a minute. And these words that I command you today, command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. Teach. Not just speak or proclaim it. And shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. This is not talking about being a fanatic, but this is talking about having the atmosphere filled with the fruit of God's word everywhere. Listen, 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 listen. Verse 8 says, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And the priests literally did this in the Old Testament. Those of the, the Levites. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Reminders of who God is, how much he loves you, and abiding in his presence continually is where the fruit of our lives will bring a, a great harvest. So men, in closing, my points in summary are as follows. Listen to this. Being a man consists number one, of a relationship with Jesus Christ and walking in proper position with God. 
so that your God-given purpose may be fulfilled and your destiny achieved. Man, that's why we have Sons of Thunder. We really dig down into the nuts and bolts of it in Sons of Thunder. And I, I can tell you, be, belonging to something like that has just changed my life. See, man, we, we need to talk, and there are things we need to talk about that don't include, you know, the women. Because, you know, when I take your car into the shop at Trent, especially when I was still in the back at a, as a mechanic or as a technician on your car, you didn't come in there with your car. Whatever was wrong with your car went into a place that was kind of in hiding. And somebody worked on it. And when it got put back into your hand, it was better. Sometimes we men, we got to come into the garage away from our wives and our families and get worked on so that when we turn to them, we can be better. Now, I ain't got no car wash or no man wash over here, so I ain't going to get you all cleaned up on the outside. But if we can help one another, we'll be cleaner on the inside. And it will project outwardly as we live our life. What's going on with my husband? Something's changing about him. I love that. Oh, I love that. Let's keep going. Number two, love your wife as Christ loves the church. Give yourself devotedly to every aspect of her life to bring her into her place of greatness. That is the man's responsibility. The Lord says you shall sanctify her by the washing of the water of the word. He told that to Adam. He told that to man. That, that's not what I'm going to do. It's your responsibility. And God is ultimately doing it because he is the word and it's his word we're doing it with. But it's my responsibility to take it upon myself in my hands to make certain it happens. Sometimes when a wife is irreverent and out of control and not doing what she needs to do and is, that, is, is not that kind of woman that will make that man known in the gate, sometimes all that fella has to do is look back What am I doing? Now, if you're in the fight and you're making it happen, you may not be a genius in the word of God, but whatever little bit you know, whatever little bit you heard, and praying for her and praying for your guidance as you direct her is amazing. I didn't see that Joseph was a scholar. Mary's Joseph, husband of Mary, the stepfather of Jesus. But I know he heard from the Lord and directed her from one place to the other, to the other, to the other, to keep that child protected from getting killed, where he needs to be born. And he spoke to Joseph every step of the way. I do have to give Mary credit. She listened and followed. That's your assignment. That's your assignment, man, to make certain. She is brought to her place of greatness. Third thing, Adam, train up your children. Chastisement is a great part of that responsibility, according to Hebrews 12, 5 through 11. And we read that earlier. Let's go to Psalm 128. And let's listen to this as we're bringing this to a close. Psalm 128. And I'm going to read the whole psalm. Because it kind of recaps all three of these points. Psalm 128 verses 1 through 6. Whether we feel like we got the gift of teaching and training or not. Men, it is our responsibility to make certain that, okay, Lord, help me. Because you've given me a calling and a responsibility on this earth as a man, as a husband, as a father. Those three things we are to always walk in. If we have a wife and we have children, then we're to walk as a man of God, as a husband, and as a father. And in that order. And because of that, and he's blessed us with the, with the, with, with the, the wife, um, you know, the man that finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Part of that favor is not only the help, help that we receive from that wife, but part of that favor from the Lord, too, is all we've been talking about with these children today. That's favor to get a heritage. Everybody's not getting a heritage. Okay, so if, 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 if your parents...
parents pass away, they, they're not leaving it to me in their will. Right? If my parents pass away, I don't see none of y'all's names already in there. I haven't seen the wills yet either, but you, you understand? So that's favor as well because I have been favored in my parents' life over the next person that they may have known and the kids grown up to an adult around them all their lives, but they don't, they don't have that inheritance from them. Got it? So that's part of my favor from the Lord. The man that finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. We need to read this then. So blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. Adam. When you eat the labor of your hands, you shall be happy, and it shall be well with you. Listen, listen. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine in the very heart of your house. Your children like olive plants all around your table. Blessing, just blessing everywhere. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you out of Zion, and may you see the good of Jerusalem all the days of your life. Yes, may you see your children's children, which is your grandchildren. What a beautiful thing. And if you don't have children yet, that's okay. Pray this message over someone else's life. And enjoy praying to me, whether it's a brother, sister, aunt, uncle, cousin that has children, good friends. Be a part of what God has called us to be on this earth in this realm of things concerning marriage and children. We have to. I'm, and I'm telling you, when you can pour out your life into something that somebody else is being blessed with, and the Bible said, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, right? Okay. When we can do that, you'd be amazed at God, how God will manifest himself with something in our lives that is going to be so fruitful for us. We can't, can hardly contain ourselves. Listen, men, let's be men for life. The life of Christ, the life of our families, the life of ourselves. Find some me time activities that will help round out who you are. Okay? Sometimes we've got to pull back. We've got to find some me time activities. Mine is drag racing. You, you, you go, if you try to, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm, because I had to learn this lesson the hard way about myself, you try to take my drag racing away from me, whether I'm going to watch or I'm, going, I'm taking my own race car to the track, which I plan on doing here in just a couple of weeks. You're in trouble. Because I'm not giving up Damon anymore. Totally sacrificing yourself and everything about you is not healthy either. So that is not what this message is advocating. This message is about how to balance those things that we need to be doing that we may not be fulfilling. Men, find you some me time activities. I don't care if it's bowling, tennis, golf, and don't oversaturate yourself with that. Now you're coming out of balance the other way. Don't always find yourself at the racetrack every weekend away from your family, away from your children. Hey, wait a minute now. We have to check it. Things that you enjoy, whether anyone else enjoys them or not. I can go sit right by myself for eight, nine, ten hours at the drag show. Next car is burning out. Go get me a cheeseburger, sit back and put my feet together. I don't care if it ain't nobody else at the track but me and the cars that are racing down the track. I don't have to talk to anyone, see anyone, smell anyone. Again. My phone can be turned off, left in the car. Because that's my me time spot. That's, my, that's one of my happy places. All right. And when I get home, man, I'm in a great mood. <laughs> Y'all, come on now. And everybody's got some kind of activity, whether it's playing music, which is also one of mine. Whether it's observing a good baseball game or going out playing a good game of catch or football or cornhole. You know, some people are taking a, playing checkers, board games, or painting, uh, creating crafts and art, whatever it is. Hanging out with your children. If you're an adult, you got children and grandchildren, hanging out with them could be just, that could be your me time. Going shopping. I know that that's a me time for the ones of the other gender. 
Cost you a three hour drive sometimes to go to these special places of shopping. Of course, Big Daddy gets something out of it too. Though. Every now and then I'll put something in the basket. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm not going to let that go. Are you kidding? All right. Listen. Men want you to cry often. Cry often. We've got ladies sometimes that say, I have a hard time to cry. I'm ashamed to cry. No, 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 no. no. God gave you those tear ducts to work them, baby. He gave you those tear ducts to work them. Same thing as getting angry. Oh, I can't get angry. And sooner or later, you're going to bust. The Bible says to be, in fact, it's a command. It says, be angry, but sin not. That emotion was put in you for a reason and a purpose. Martin Luther King Jr. was probably one of the angriest men that ever walked the earth. How did he handle it? Jesus Christ, our Savior, was definitely the most angry person. Our God was the most angry that we could ever know. Because sin had shipwrecked his creation. And what did he do about it? He didn't sin. Yet without sin, the Bible says, everything he did. Men cry often, laugh out loud, and get plenty of rest. Everything need to be not so need not to be so serious. Be not so rigid, but remain flexible so that you don't break. It's don't no polarization of life. You know, no, it's either black or white. There's a lot of gray in between there. Be flexible. Be flexible. This is ultimate advice. Adam, where are you? Where, where are you? Where art thou? If I can get my, my paperwork separated here, I can finish teaching this. Keep a great network of Christian men to talk to and to have fellowship with. That they may also serve as counselors, advisors, confidants, and accountability partners. I got one or two of them at work. I got one of the, one or two of them at work, and and I mean, you know, since I hit this city, there's, there's one of them, and our paths just cross from the moment I hit this city to then all of a sudden I look and, and he's working at a bank that I have one of our we have one of our bank accounts with, and then all of a sudden, I, you know, through the shifting and whatever of jobs, now he's a financial manager, officer, and, man, and finance manager at the dealership I work at. I walk in and we got hired there like within a week apart. It's crazy. Okay, Lord, I got it. Because we've already walked together in some things, working in some community ministry work and stuff, when I hardly even could remember his name, all the way to the point now I know his name and remember his name. He's one of my accountability partners. And the encouragement we give each other, the days we lock that office door and cry and talk about things that are upsetting our lives, whether it be with our wives and children and family, to activities, to ministry work, to work, to that job. I mean, it's just, you got to have that guy. you got to have that guy, at least one. This keeps you low on stress, time to process your anger properly, and emotionally stable. We have to have that. We don't, we men, we, we're so overpowering at things in life sometimes, we don't even want to recognize and acknowledge what emotions that are arising up in us. That, that, the things that we're feeling, we don't want to acknowledge feeling. Because, you know, most of the time we we're taught not to, not to feel. We, we, are, we are trained that way. In some, but that's wrong. A leader must be all of these things so that we do not react but are able to respond at the time of decision, no matter how tough they are. We must love like God loves. We must have the compassion of Christ. We must have empathy, whereas that means that we can walk as though we're walking in someone else's shoes to feel what they feel. Maybe we haven't experienced, but let's work real hard so that we can administer the right kind of love and care for that individual. It's a challenge. It's a tough bill to feel to be a man. But these are all components of Adam and God's intended purpose for Adam. Adam, where are you? Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your teaching, for the word that has come forth. Thank you for this opportunity and privilege that we have to do something so, so honorable as to lift up the name of Jesus. What a privilege it is for us to 
carry forth your, your mission and your commission upon this earth to share your word with one another, to teach one another, to encourage one another, and to love one another, to share the gifts and talents of life that you've given each one of us to share with each other and with the world. We love you. You are magnificent. But most importantly, we know that you first loved us. We could not love you first. We thank you for the fellowship that we have together with one another and with you. We thank you for the tithes and offerings and the gifts that have been given into this ministry, whether it be food, clothing, things that people need, whether there's been things that we use to work with in this ministry. Father, all things come of thee, and you have given to us without reservation. You have given plentiful to us. We thank you for every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places that have been given unto us, and for you supplying all of our needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Thank you, Father. Bless those who give who have given to, not only into this ministry, but into others around them. For you said that if they will give, if we give, it shall be given unto us. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, it shall be given unto our bosom. You said if you'll bring your tithes and offerings into the storehouse, so there'll be meat in your house. You said, Father, that's watch and try you in this thing. Try you in it. You're challenging us. You try you and give it tithes and offerings so that we'll see you open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessings that we have not even room to receive. And we can continue to pass it forward to others. Because if I can't keep it, somebody else has got to have it. Amen. So thank you, Father, for your grace being upon this place, upon the people that are in this place, and upon those who are watching and viewing by, by whatever resource that they're using to, to check us out here, to hear the word of the Lord being instructed. We love you, Father. We thank you so much. Amen. We're going to have our announcements given to us now by uh, our administrative assistant. Miss uh, Nadine Buchanan, I'll lower the microphone, she's a little shorter than I am. Not, low, not quite low enough. There we go. <laughs> good morning, good afternoon, good evening, all of that. It is a jubilant July at New Beginning Celebration. Welcome the family and guests few announcements. Thank you, as always, for attending our Sunday morning worship celebration of our King Jesus. Our Sunday morning worship celebration is the first through fourth Sunday at 1030 a.m. And our midweek expiration through scripture is the first through fourth Wednesdays at 7 p.m. We do have a couple of small groups that are on Thursdays at 7 p.m. We keep that schedule up on our announcement board as you live our uh, facility. The small groups this month July 14th, which is this Thursday, Sons of Thunder at 7 p.m. And then July 28th, Daughters of Sarah at 7 p.m. We have a few special announcements. We have on July 16th, this Saturday, movie night at 6 p.m. right here. If you want to come early and grab a bite to eat, maybe play a game of cornhole if the thunder and lightning and rain holds off, get here about 5 for that. Love to see everyone out here participating in that. It's always a great night. Our assisted living ministry, which usually is on the fourth Tuesday of every month, for Gardens of Pamlico, is still on hold. So we ask that you continue to pray for our brothers and sisters residing in the Gardens of Pamlico. And in lieu of that, on July 26th at 7 p.m., we have a prayer night here. A reminder that we will not have any worship celebration July 31st. It is the fifth Sunday. You can come, but Pastor won't be here. <laughs> a community announcement. We have a few community announcements. Uh, we have, for those who are in town and want to go to Union Point Park, on Friday, July 15th at 6.30 p.m. is Footloose on the Noose. You can get your groove on if you like to shake and move your, your feet and all that good jazz. On Monday, July the 18th at 7 p.m., we have Forgotten Country Christian Alliance at Moore's Barbecue. And then... Tuesday, July 19th at 7 p.m. is the Carter, the Craven County Taxpayers <laughs> Association, downtown New Bern. And also, there's a movie night at Union Point Park on Friday, July 29th at dusk. If you'd like to go and attend that, that's a free event as well. If you'd like to give to the Lord through this ministry, all envelopes and collection containers are available on the table to my right. And for our tech-savvy friends and guests and those out watching, you can give to the Lord through this ministry via our cash app, which is the dollar sign, all capital letters, NB Celebration, and the number one. 
But as always, thank you for choosing New Beginning Celebration to feed on the Word of God. You're important to us, you're somebody, and you're loved. And for those who are here, please, story, please be sure to stick around for refreshments and fellowship afterwards. Thank you. All right, so that's, that's the end of uh, our worship celebration today. Remember, we are New Beginning Celebration, 3400 Trent Road, Newborn, North Carolina. 28562 is our zip code, but we're 3400 Trent Road, Suite D. Please come and attend. She, she gave the announcement, 1030 a.m. Sunday, uh, 7 o'clock Wednesdays. We are here to uplift the name of Jesus and to celebrate new beginnings in Christ Jesus. You see our phone number. Our phone number is above or behind my head. It is 252-631-2188. I hope I'm not in the way. And our website is nbcelebration at yahoo.com, or no, excuse me, nbcelebration.com is our website, and our email address is nbcelebration at yahoo.com. So visit our website, see what we're about. If you go to that website, you can read everything that we firmly believe and desire to be in Christ Jesus and what we do. You'll see a scheduling, of course, of all of our ministry functions here that are usually our regular standard ministry functions. And then if you have any comments or, or anything you want to, to, to communicate or speak with someone here, nbcelebration at yahoo.com, 252-631-2188. Thank you so much for joining us out there. And those of you joining us here, I wish for you nothing but blessings upon blessings from the Lord and to have a great day and enjoying life.